Hello, I'm Denis St. Clair. My Tzashat name is U'asukwis, given to me by the elders. It roughly means he who listens and remembers. I've been asked to come today to describe the mural, the elements of the mural down at Harbor K that uh, was just opened a few weeks ago. Um, so I think I'll start with the center and then move around because the center, as you see, the images are quite a bit larger, but they're the focus of Sashad history of, uh, say, the last century. Um, in the center, we have the portrait honoring Adam Shewish, the uh, late Tai Hawit, who died actually this December, will be 30 years ago. Um, a great man, a great a new channel and Sushat leader. Um, and then we have um, the other names of people here. I'll just hold off for a minute to give you background history. The Sushat, modern day Sushat, sometimes referred to as the Greater Sushat or Amalgamated Sushat, um, came into being in the 17, late 17, latter part of the 1700s. Originally, Sushat Hahotli, as we know it today, was territory divided amongst at least five nations and probably more that we're not too sure who they were now. It's been too long. Um, through a number of, of reasons, through a number of reasons, uh, reduced population drastically reduced by importation inadvertently of uh, European diseases, smallpox and that kind of thing, plus warfare, numbers really decreased. Some nations were under a great deal of pressure to be, even survive. It so it happened that through luck as much as anything else, that Sashad also suffered a great deal, but not as much. So a number of nations came to the Tzashat uh, within uh, two generations at the very most, probably less, and asked for Tzashat help, for Tzashat protection, asked if they could live with Tzashat. Yes, said the Taiha West of the time, but of course, it, through New Channel tradition, what that means when that happens, when one nation asks another if they can come and live with them, it's giving up their independence. They're no longer an autonomous, an independent First Nation. They are now becoming amalgamated with the nation that they're asking permission from. Their territory, their Hahotli, becomes part of the Hahotli of the group that's welcoming them in and protecting them. So this happened at least on four occasions with the Tzashat. So their territory continued to grow from the latter part of the 1700s up until probably the last one was around 1815. So the territory just bloomed in size, huge increase. And um, so these figures represent that. The first group to join, again in the 1700s, we don't have an exact date, you know, the, the European system of dating was not used then. Um, was by the Machlai'at, who had their Machlai, their, their main village, was on what Mamashni, what the European society calls Wauer Island, and we still, those in the know, call it Machlai. And from that come the Machlai'at, because At means people of. So the Tsushat are the people of Tsusha. Machlai'at are the people of Maklai. Uh, and then, then you go on and, and these people, like uh, he represents the uh, Hachat. So Hachat are the people of Hacha. Anyway, um, so the first group was the Maklayat. And this, uh, a century ago, this man, Captain Bill, the old, older brother of Clutacy, uh, who um, George Jr. is the recent, uh, is the present eldest member, uh, were the first to join. The next, very soon after, we can't exactly say how long, but I would think within a decade or even less, were the Nashasat. And the Nashasat, a century ago, their senior person, their Hawith, Tai Hawith, 
head of the whole amalgamated nation, how with chiefs of the component groups that amalgamated, so they had standing, they had seats, but they weren't, they didn't own the land. It was this man and his ancestor who owned that, because that was the position of any Taiha with, within New Channel, <coughs> excuse me, New Channel society, it was the head chief, the Taiha with, who owned, if you could call it that, it's kind of a foreign term, the land. These people had hereditary rights and high standing, but they didn't own the land. They did before their groups had to amalgamate, but that's what I was saying. Once amalgamation occurred, they no longer possessed the land, owned the land, if you wish. It was now the head chief of the welcoming group. Syachibus, of course, is very famous, and uh, we all, as Tsisha, should, you know, uh, feel uh, very, that he's a very special man because he was probably the most important uh, informant, knowledge sharer that the great anthropologist Edward Shapir, Sapir had when he came here in 1910, and he was back and forth between 1910 and 14. Alec Thomas, uh, Walter's great-grandfather, grandfather, grandfather um, was another very important uh, um, informant. Uh, okay, so he was the, the, the Hawit of the Nashasat. He could have had other seats as well within the Tsushat, um, because with huge population decline, you get less and less people in the descent lineage for a senior person, and sometimes it ends up in the same person. So he had the ability to have been the Hawit of the Mukwat Ushtakemeth, group, subgroup of the original Tsushat. He could have been, and indeed became, the Hawith of the Nakshasat, a, a nation that joined Tsushat. And he could have been head chief of the Uchukpasit through his mother, because all the other relatives died out. But he chose Nakshasat. This is Peter Kishkish, who, um, quite old, when this, this is taken from a, a, an early photograph. And this is Santo. Peter uh, Kishkish was uh, Hachad, Hawith, and Santo was Ikuhad. And the Hachad joined the Tsushat, let's say 1800. It may be in a few years before, a couple of years after 1800 is our best estimate. And Ikuhat, we uh, have a pretty good idea, it was 1815 because um, a government official who was here, George Blankensop, um, in 1874, was, elders told him that it was about 60 years before that, so therefore about 1815. So hence why we're honoring these people, that because they represent heritages of the separate nations that have com combined into one, so now let's having that sort of background history and explanation of these men, let's move this way because this whole mural represents the beach of the site of the formal, former village of Kluquatkuis, which translate in, into wolf ritual beach. Kluquana is the wolf, wolf ritual, the most important ceremonial activity that New Channel people had, and certainly Tsushat, and that's where it took place. So if you think of the whole year cycle of going down back to Barclay Sound in the late winter, early spring, then herring spawning runs and stuff early on, Tsushat in throughout the 1800s and early 20th century, in the early spring would be in the uh, sheltered islands of the Broken Group. In other words, protected by the other islands. And then they moved to the outer islands for some in May for summer whale hunting and uh, a sealing and, and halibut and cod offshore. Um, and then they'd come back up by late August. They'd be here in Alberni because they're following the Tai. In those days, it was the Tai that they were after and coming up. 
even more than the sockeye. When they finished fishing in the Somas, so very intensive fishing in the canal and the harbor and the Somas, right up until the end of November, because we've got springs, coho, and chum, or dog salmon. And their, their spawning runs overlapped. So by the time they're finished, and then all the, the smoking and drying and all the work, very intense labor that went on with that, be over around end of November. Then they moved to Klukwatkowis at the foot of uh, the beach that used to exist where the marina is now and Harbor Key or K, depending how you want to pronounce it. Um, that was taken away from Tsushat by granting an uh, English mill company the right in 1860 to build a mill there. So the land was inappropriately taken away from Tsushat and we're fighting to get it back through special uh, claims. Um, but that's where Tsushat would go when the fishing season was over. And, and, and you could think of it as a, a two month celebration or holiday because the year's work was done so December and most of January was in traditional new channel fishing, uh, sorry, feasting, so-called potlatching, various ceremonies that come under that blanket. It's not a very good word, but anyway. And the most important of those was the wolf ritual, the Klokwana. So we celebrate that because it, it definitely was inappropriately taken away. It's maybe going to, you know, we hope we get uh, compensation for that. So this beach represents the beach in front of the houses that would have been there. Um, if we start with the, on the left, we've got here four wolves representing the four nations that joined Sashat, amalgamated with Sashat. And their greeting, you notice another wolf coming in that looks a little bit different. So the fifth wolf, wolf, of course, is the Taiha West, represents the Taiha West of the Tsushat. In the picture, it's Adam Shuish, but his ancestors that he inherited the title from his dad, Jacob Shuish, his uncle, Wadi Shuish, his grandfather, um, uh, Shuish, and his great grandfather, Hayupanol, and so far back, as far we go. Um, there, so, that's who this wolf represents, the Taiha with. Notice there is a strange sort of protrudence sticking up from the back of this wolf. And if you are able to see, or if you look at the mural when you go down there, you'll see that it is a dorsal fin. Dorsal fin of a whale. These are orcas. They're not the whales that were hunted. Well, orcas really weren't hunted. But there is a strong new channel tradition about supernatural wolves and supernatural orcas transforming into each other. So wolves could come down on to the beach and they could transform and go into the water. And as they entered the water, they became orcas. The reverse could happen. Supernatural orcas, not every orca, those that were supernatural would come to the beach and as they reached the beach to the, the gravel, the, the, the sand, they would start to transform into wolves. Again, not all wolves, not all orcas, the supernatural ones. And so you can hear the, see here, the transformation is almost finished. All that's left is the dorsal fin of the whale. So that's what this represents. Representing, of course, that is not only that these wolves represent the various formerly independent First Nations, but also the fact that this was Wolf Ritual Beach where we would have the Cloquana. And the Cloquana, um, high status people, but even those people not so high status would go through. It involves uh, wolves seizing the people who had been dis um, picked as being initiates. They'd be taken away into the forest and for up to a month, uh, they would be trained in secret things about the wolf society. And then the whole Klukwana, the whole wolf ritual, would be to get them back, 
to have them uh, liberated from the wolves and uh, return to human form. And so there'd be big, what we, again we could call for convenience sake, a uh, potlatch or cloquana where the wolves would come and they'd be on the roof of the longhouse and you'd hear them and beating and drumming and, and the men would run out and try to get the initiates back and there'd be tussles and it wouldn't be su successful for a while. But eventually, you know, they, they, uh, the young people who had been taken away would be freed from the wolves and be brought into the hall, brought into the house, and through a, a series of events, uh, return to their human form. And so th that's what this speech is. The wolves are two responsibilities, or two roles representing the different nations, but also what this speech was. And that important part of the year, at the end of the year, two months of, okay, we've done all the fish and all that hard work and the hunting and down in Barkley Sound and, and the fishing and hunting. And here's now about two months where we can kick back, we can celebrate who we are, we can celebrate the most important things uh, in our culture, our winter ceremonies. And this is very important, uh, obviously, in the, in the cultural scheme of things. Also over here, there, it's going to be hard for you to see, but again, if you go down to the mural, the actual mural, you see five figures, and they're praying to the sun. They're morning prayers, which all proper, really brought up people would do, would uh, go down. It was part of culture to, to start your day with prayers. And again, there's five people. Again, that number five, because again, five representing the five groups that form what we now think of as the, the Tzishat in their present form. Um, so anyway, they're praying and uh, there's the sun. And then we have a transition over here and we're now in the night. We've got the moon. And you can see the canoe and two people and one person you can see is spearing or in actual fact harpooning. And this is uh, representing a special thing that was done uh, by Tsushad and, and others, but we know mostly with Tsushad because Edward Sapir, who um, Satchpis was the main informant of for, that I talked about starting in 1910, he talked about in detail how Tsushad would uh, adapted whaling gear with the big seal skin floats that would be attached to the lines after the whale had been harpooned to as many as you could get on the line and that would slow the whale down, tired it out, and allow it to be captured. Well, in a very small form, this was done in fishing for tai. Sea lion bladders, only about that big, were used. And again, maybe half a dozen would end up being used um, where torch, this, this is representing, there'd be a light in the canoe, a torch, or uh, cedar boards with gravel put on, and then um, a fire lit, and it wouldn't burn the canoe. And that technique was used in Barclay Sound during uh, bird migrations in the spring, whenever to attract birds in at night when they're sort of floating on the water sleeping, when ducks and geese and stuff were going by by the thousands. So anyway, the light would attract the fish up, then they'd be harpooned as they got close to the surface. Now, a harpoon is different from a spear in that the harpoon head comes off, like just like a whaling harpoon does. It comes off and then the, the animal screams away and then uh, you try to do it again and again with a whale until you can capture it. With Tai, probably only I'd do it once, but if it was just a spear, it would go in and then the fish would be powerful enough to get away. So you want to have the harpoon, there's a line attached to the harpoon head and you can play it until you get it in. So this is a very special form of fishing, whereas during the daytime it'd be fish weirs, traps, and things all along the Somas, and a whole bunch where the pulp mill is now, the mud flats that are bare at low tide. And down we've got big fish traps for the first not quite 10 miles down the down the canal that were used. But this was not traps, this was uh, harpooning. So a really special adaptation that shows how thoroughly uh, Tsushat specifically, or New Channels in general, understood 
the environment, they understood the species that they were wanting to catch and what's the most efficient way of catching them. Um, then we, we arrive, and then of course the moon, because moon prayers were addressed to the moon just as they were in the mornings to the sun. And now we're staying on the beach, but here is a special tribute to not previous generations of a century or more ago, but today. And the actual person that is represented here, or the person shown here, is Brian Watts. And it's, he's representing Hai Hopayak, all the, the young people who have been trained in traditional song and dance and cultural elements by their teachers, Trevor and Lena. And uh, he is chosen because he exemplifies the interest that the youth of today are gaining and the knowledge they're gaining from Hahopayak. And so there he is in his regalia and with his uh, baton, his uh, eagle tail, to keep time, as we all know, to the singers. So here is the past, the symbolism of the past, and here is the present as we move forward, maintaining culture, uh, reviving culture, and expanding culture.